I find it very difficult to say when I decided I wanted to be an artist. I can remember from very, very early days. I can remember at nursery school being very cross that everybody had clustered round to see some child who'd drawn a dreadful country cottage with hollyhocks outside, whereas I drew horses and carts, and I knew that that was a better and classier thing to do. At school, I had to pay sixpence for every rough book that I had ruined by drawing. So I suppose gradually one began to feel that that was the sort of thing I was good at, the sort of thing I cared about. It didn't really occur to me to do anything else. So I went to Bournemouth, which was quite near my own home. I lived at the YWCA and I was there for four years. I did the National Diploma. I think it's changed now, or it's changed to a degree now. And it, I chose to do painting for my last two years. I did a little bit of lithography, but that was the only bit of printmaking I ever did when I was at art school. It's difficult to remember what were the influences at school. I remember Graham Sutherland was much admired, and that's quite interesting because he seems to have gone off the scene, you might say now. The small groups, William Gear was one of them, um, who did very precise, often interiors, always with figures in them. We were always expected to make a good composition with figure drawing in it. Again, that's something that would be quite different now, I imagine. I've, I then went to do the art teacher's course at Goldsmiths and I, I was married and lived very near and I must say though I don't think I ever wanted to be a dedicated teacher it was very nice to be in Goldsmiths and to be near London it was all a bit exciting I was a painter at art school and I continued to be a painter I had a couple of paintings in the Royal Academy so you know I was a proper painter but I became a very much a lapsed artist. I continued to draw, but all through the time of having three small children and doing up a really tatty but rather beautiful house in Greenwich. Painting was on the back boiler, you might say. And when my last child went off to nursery school, I was longing to get back to work. And I started going to Morley College, which was in South London. But that was lovely. Um, there was a tutor called Adrian Bartlett, and suddenly one didn't talk about children, one didn't talk about one's husband's shirt, one didn't talk about the fact that the, oh, I don't know, the ironing had gone wrong or something. Uh, one concentrated entirely on just learning how to etch, and that was lovely. It was like having all the bits of one's mind concentrated on one thing. and. I just became hooked, I think. I think it was so nice and easy to translate what I had been doing, which was merely ink drawings in a sketchbook that I carried everywhere, and suddenly you could use the stylus like a pencil. And it was easy, and it seemed a direct, a direct relation somehow to do that. One of the things that probably kept me going was the fact that other people who lived around Greenwich were also etchers. A few years later, we all got together and eventually formed a group called the Greenwich Printmakers. And the gallery that we started still exists today and does very well. So it really was a case of a lot of people coming together that I wouldn't have known about had I not gone there. I don't think I ever came away without having learnt some odd titbit, and I rather regret that now. You know, I don't have that same association. Coming to Mersey 29 years ago, in 88, we came from a very tall, thin Georgian house on five floors with my studio in the basement, which I shared with the washing. And I might say, as ferric chloride came over, <laughs> the washing suffered a bit. Um, but I used to look up then and see people's feet walking by. So it was rather wonderful to come here where the light came in, 
and the, suddenly the world went horizontal instead. I think fairly early on, I didn't want to draw something like landscape, which was rather ethereal. I wanted something definite to draw when I look back. I can't tell you why that was. Probably some psychiatrist would delve in some way and come up with something. Um, I wanted something very firm and obvious. And it wasn't till quite a lot later that I began to see other things as well. I particularly, you'll think it an odd thing to say, but I particularly fell in love with fish in Ireland where, where we bought a little house and where we still go a great deal. When we went fishing for the first time, I found it one of the most magical things I'd ever done, these incredible silver things that came up from the depths. And you could look down in the water and you could, in the way that one looks up into the branches of a tree and sees birds, you could look down into the water and the fronds of seaweed would have mackerel floating around them like black shadows. It was completely magical. And I still retain that. And of course, coming to Mersey, where the fishermen are the people who count. Um, it's rather nice that that's brought two worlds together for me. I enjoy stories. I enjoy poems. I like poetry anyway. I read quite a lot. Um, and if it all comes together, then that's my, my lucky day, you might find, say. I mean, Jonah, which I've done three quite big prints of the story of Jonah and the whale. And incidentally, that has been embellished by, in Ireland, having a day when whales were washed up. And so for several hours, I could walk amongst three whales. And it was the most extraordinary experience. Um, a tiny, tiny eye looks at you and seems to be talking to you almost. And I could touch these odd creatures and their, their hides were like, like an old creased um, raincoat. Quite, quite extraordinary. And then they were pushed off into the water and went I don't know where. But they and the story of Jonah, um, I've been able to knit in so that if you look at the picture of Jonah's escape that I've got on the wall, you'll see that there's their little Mersey fishing boats in the distance. And it's been nice to be able to localize it in that way. It's purely sentimental, I suppose, but I have found it fun. And I've gone on from that too, to do a big print called Fishers of Men, which comes from the biblical, Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. And so I've been able to put all sorts of local items that I've enjoyed drawing into that print, including my poor husband who had to slide on and off the sofa for some hours while I drew him. But um, there are, I've, I've always found the, the naming of a print very important. And sometimes I don't get it right. But if I can get a name that seems to match that's great pleasure to me. When I first came to Mersey, I thought I must find some other artists. So I joined the Colchester Art Society. I rang up and asked if I could join. And they said, oh, yes, put, find somebody to put you up. And I said, but I didn't know anybody at all. So very kindly, somebody suggested that I should go and see Tim Holding, who was teaching at the Institute. And he, there was the most enormous noise when I got there, and it was completely, I didn't know where I turned up. But he was so helpful and so nice and said, of course you must join, and they'll be lucky to have you. And I felt quite all right after that. <laughs> there are benefits of knowing other people. Obviously, that's very nice. But also, there are benefits of deadlines. You know, if you've... It, it's very useful to belong to something because it, it's a good kickstart to make sure you do finish that and frame this and so on and so forth. I used
use copper nearly always. I love copper and I have the luck to have a guillotine so I can actually cut the copper myself. I begin by cutting the piece of copper the right size. I have that. The copper then has to be cleaned with French chalk so that there's absolutely no grease on it at all. And the plate is then heated on my hot plate here and ink is rolled onto it from a little ball with a roller. When it's cooled just enough so I can move it, I put it in jaws which hang from the ceiling and I flame the wax surface with tapers till it has a sort of black, shiny, mirror-like look. I've carbonized the wax, I think, and so it's very pleasant to draw into it. People often say when they come to open studios, is it very hard work pressing on the copper? Of course it isn't, it's like silk, it's like, um, it's like pen and ink, it's very enjoyable to do. And you have the advantage that you have varnish that can be put over the lines you didn't mean to do, which always happens. So having got the drawing, I then put it in a bath of ferric chloride for varying amounts of times and take it out, clean off the ground, take a proof to see how you're doing. Then you go all over the same thing again, put on another ground, add extra drawing, put it into the ferric chloride again for minutes or hours as it need be, um, so on and so on. There are always ways of making textures which one dreams up. If you look around, you'll see that I've used the little bags that oranges come in as sort of fishing net. Um, all sorts of odds and ends, um, feathers, all sorts of bits that will make a texture. At last, once has got the plate you're happy with, um, then you have to choose your paper. I personally use Somerset 300 GSM, and I find that very nice and thick and rich. Um, it has to be well soaked in the bath then brought in and put between plastics and pressed overnight. And then it's lovely and soft and perfect for printing. So the plate has to be inked up. The ink has to be mixed. The plate is wiped. As you know, you'll start with a little tampon of, of netting and scrub in the ink everywhere and then gradually it has to be wiped off. And finally, and this is death to the hands, you take off your plastic glove and you wipe the surface. And that's why when I bought my fish the other day, the woman said to me, you been gardening or you been printing or both? <laughs> because I was filthy. But um, then the plate is laid on the bed of the press the paper is picked up with little things called fingers, little folds of paper, put between blotters, and it's blotted so that it's no damp on it at all. But if you put it against your cheek, it's lovely and soft. And the paper is then placed over the plate in exactly the right place. A piece of tissue is put on top. The tissue is there because you don't want the size in the paper to go into the blankets to make them hard. And one is winds the press through. And please God, the other end, the plate looks as you wish it.